our ta- our topic, um, which was proposed by Alexander, is the Exodus versus the lynch mob, and um, and I was thinking about uh, I was thinking about Heidegger, and I was thinking about his notion of authenticity, and I was thinking about the authentic person is the guy perhaps who joins the Exodus. Uh, am I getting that right, Alexander? Or, or? yeah, but especially we're looking at leadership. So. Um, in Digital Libido, Jan Sedekist and I identified the authentic phallus and the fake phallus. The fake phallus leads uh, by arranging uh, an abjection. So say you got Hitler and the Jew, you got Stalin and the Kulak, you got um, Pol Pot and anybody who wore glasses in Cambodia in the 1970s. So, or it could be just woke today has the white heterosexual man. So you find somebody you can hate and thereby in theory, unify everybody else into some kind of a lynch mob, right? So that's how lynch mobs operate. Um, that's the fake phallus. The authentic phallus, though, more difficult and much more rare in history, unfortunately, is the proper authentic leader. Now, if you look at, that's why we wanted to study the exodus for the new book, not just the exodus out of Egypt, but all the exoduses, since we've been working with paradigm shifts our entire over. So all our books are about the current paradigm shift, essentially that. What does it mean to leave industrialism with capitalism and mass media and, and, and the life we sort of lived here and move into the new realm of the internet society or, or the internet age or the network society and digitalization, what does that mean? And of course, a whole new class structure will step forward. Some people are better at or more fortunate when it comes to having the resources that pay off in a new society. We identified that in the book called The Netocrats 20 years ago. So all our work has been about paradigm shifts. And a paradigm shift really is an exodus out of one age into a new age. Yeah. So we call this exodology. That's, ex- that's what we pursue in this book. The theory on exoduses. Why did they happen? Why did it tend to be so successful compared to the alternatives, which is, of course, our lynch mobs? And why do you leave a certain territory, say the Egypt of the lynch mob, and you walk into the promised land of the Exodus? Um, and, and what does that take? And of course, this ties into the authentic phallus, who, of course, leads the Exodus, a Moses, for example, and the fake phallus, who obviously leads the lynch mob. And I don't know if this is part of Girard's fantastic study on the lynch mob or not. Uh, he, when he talks about Satan, that is the tyrant to us. In, in our last episode, we talked about the Satan's antidote. the tyrant and the mob, though, right? Satan is the spirit of the mob. No, well, the spirit of the mob is the anoject. So yeah. what's important always is to find the precursor to the phenomenon you're going to study. So we can call all of this, we can call all of this paradigmatic embryonism. I suggested mm-hmm. it to our dear friend Brady along the other day and he loved it. So paradigmatic embryonism means you study who was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time before the paradigm started or who saw it coming and could therefore prepare for it and was hungry enough to actually benefit from it. In other words, who's the Hebrew in Egypt when Moses comes along? Mm-hmm. Okay, so the anoject is clearly the lynch mob. It's, it's this Heideggerian dust man. So it's clearly the, uh, nobody actually says it, but it's assumed. Like you uh, does man is, the, is a Heideggerian word for inauthentic? Is that? Yeah, like one rather than you or I. So it's not somebody who speaks about this, like, I believe, but rather one believes. Oh, I see. And when you say one believes, you're hiding behind something. You say yeah. one believes in the general sense, like, well, so, I just believe like everybody else because I'm a conformist and I'm scared of being the outsider of the group. And because I'm terrified of the lynch mob, I'm going to pretend I'm part of it. So I'm going to participate in the lynch mob. And I do that precisely by saying one believes that that's the object that we're going to kill. So you become the anonymous accuser, right? Yes. That's what you, it, you it, doesn't, it doesn't really mm-hmm. work in English because one in English is still, you know, even the Queen of England could say one or we or whatever she says. Uh-huh. But in, in German, the term das man, not man, man with man with two N, M A N N, which is just man, but man is like, it's very general. Swedish has, I don't know about Dane or Dutch, Thomas can say that, but in Swedish we have man as well. But man say you so instead of man, I speak, you say man speaks. So you're hiding behind something very anonymous. Heidegger hated this, right? He, he hated this authentic behavior, but what he didn't see was this was part of the very lynch mob that he participated in himself, he was the Nazis, right? So, the lynch mobs 
are assuming not only that they have an enemy they're going to attack and kill and turn into a scapegoat, who's the abject, but they also assume that they have a shared value, a shared opinion within the group called the anarchist. And all it takes is for somebody to put on the right dress at the right time and step forward and personify the anarchist and speak exactly what the anarchist would have said, and you get an Adolf Hitler. And that's exactly why guys like Adolf Hitler get to power so quickly. Because everybody's like, yeah, this is what we've been waiting for. Just like you've been waiting for a savior. You've been wait, waiting for somebody who speaks for us, who says what we want to say, who puts words what we want to say, and does so in a great uniform too. Mm-hmm. And that's when you get the tyrant. So do you think a figure like that is going to appear? Um, uh, or do you think there's a figure like that already out there? Oh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure. Or there's a bunch of them? Or, or... Oh, all these woke people out there, especially young women who lead woke today, aspire to be tyrants. We wrote a text. Yeah, but are any of them like real leaders, like, you know, who, who, can, who can get the whole population behind them? Or, you know, they don't need to get the population behind them. You missed my point. The reason why the tyrant rises so quickly is that he or she already yeah, speaks right. like the anarchist. Okay. That's exactly. It. Hitler didn't have. The Hitler's, Hitler's brigade were terribly disorganized. The Nazi party was never well organized. He was basically traveling around, being big on his ego all the time. It was hard to make decisions for Hitler. He had a terrible time. That's why he started taking amphetamines during the war, because he had found it so hard to make decisions. He was terrified of people to make decisions. He wasn't at all a great leader. Mm-hmm. No, he was just personification of the anarchic with Germany coming out of the First World War completely. He was sort of a great puppet of some kind or like... Not puppet either, because that's Marinette. That's being your, your, your... No, he knew what he was doing, but he, he believed personally that he was the personification of the German folk. Yeah. And he was. He was the personification of the German lynch mob. Hmm. I'm sure Gerard would agree. So where I agree with Gerard, he calls this figure Satan. We call him the tyrant. Uh, that's interesting because that's what Heidegger thought about him. He would personify the germ. That's why Heidegger got in trouble, right? Because in his early, uh, in his 30s, well, he said, he said, he said uh, Hitler personifies the German people. Uh, yeah, some kind of but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't have a Bart Sedekvist or a Bart Sweeney Hammer Rick and ejection theory yet. The pointer <laughs> is that nobody's done that before and yeah. we're doing pioneering work. Okay, okay. We're trying to go deeper than Girard did. And by, mm. by finding a precursor to Girard Satan, a precursor to the tyrant historically, we have the anarchy. Now, since this is inverted exodology we're doing, the lynch mob goes towards zero. It goes towards no space left. It goes, it goes towards staying within the realm where you're at and then just minimizing it, optimally minimizing it, until you die. It's a doomsday cult. Hitlerism was a doomsday cult. It was, he was yeah. doomed to fail and he loved it for it. So... The question, lynch mobs always are. That's why they're temporary, they blow up, they cause tons of havoc. Jacobins. There was no way the Jacobins could ever run France because all they did was guillotining anybody, including themselves. That's what woke people would do too. Woke people cannot lead. They can only destroy. That's what lynch mobs do. That's the problem with lynch mob in an amoral sense. Mm -hmm. Now, the opposite of that is then the exodus. And since that's what we've been working on for the past three to four years, I thought it'd be a nice move in our discussions here, especially you guys being more experts on Buddhism and Girard than I could ever possibly be. Could we then invert the inversion? So instead of doing inverted exodology, which is the theory of the lynch mob, the anarchist, and the tyrant. What would exodology look like? And here's what, where it gets interesting, because we get a much more formal and much wider and much more intense authentic phallic theory here. The theory of authentic phallus. Who's that? Well, the person's called the Nisoshian. overmensch. Uh, we can bring Nietzsche yeah. into it, right? That's, that's yeah. the next yes. step, right? That's this where you go is next, where right? the Sociant and the Messiah mm-hmm. and the Ubermensch are the same. They're all leaders of the exodus. And in the last discussion, you said the Ubermensch was not one person. You made an interesting idea that the Ubermensch should be more of a, like a tribe or something rather than a person. If Moses led the Hebrews yeah. out of Egypt, they rewrote the story later under Zoroastrian and Persian influence in Babylon as the story of the three siblings. Moses and Aaron lead. And there's also Miriam, the sister, holding the brothers accountable for what they do. That's exactly how matriarchy operates in, in relation to patriarchy. And patriarchy is always the split phallus. Okay, where do they learn that from? They learn that power must be shared and divided. Otherwise, it becomes tyranny. Where do they learn that from? The Persians. 
Who did they learn that from? Sorastra and Bishtaspa. We're back to the origin of eventology, which is Sorastra's idea that he had Vishtaspa of a split between the Mobit and Mobit and the Shanja. The king of kings and the priest of priests must not be unified. They must be separated, separate courts, separate capitals, separate system. And then you can have a supreme court to judge between them. And that's exactly what a matriarchy is. Okay. Can I bring Thomas in here? Thomas, yes. do you have any comments so far on what Alexander said before yeah, he goes further in the narrative? A very good model. Um, I'm not sure in what, in what way you go beyond Girard. I mean, this, all, this is all very much within the Girardian framework so far. Um, I really like the interpretation of Nietzsche's overman as uh, somebody who kind of opposes the mob and kind of uh, points to a better direction. So that's a very positive interpretation of the overman, which is usually like, uh, you know, interpreted as some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, he individualist, universe, right? Individual. So, so that's a very nice interpretation, I think. And, and also, I think it's, it's kind of important to, to investigate, well, what, what's that going to be in a post AI, post internet society right w what is going to lead us there it's probably going to be a group of people or or so what what's that going to look like i think that's a very a very important question that's where the exodus comes in i agree completely that's where the exodus comes in i don't see any reason at all why the elite of people the netocrats who are successful communicating with the ai and collaborate with the ai towards what i call symbiotic transcendence I don't see any reason why they would drug the vast majority of people with them, especially if they weren't gratefully received to begin with. Now, the Atonist cult in Egypt that became the origin of Hebrewism and eventually Judaism uh, that left Egypt clearly was a minority under some kind of oppression in Egypt, or at least they didn't feel they were part of the Egyptian system at all. So, you know, Tutankhamun was killed. He was probably the precursor to Christ. So Freud was probably right in that the activists of Egypt and Aton became Adonai, and Adonai is the name where you unify the other two facets of the Jewish God, which is, of course, Eloah, which is general for God, and you've got Yahweh. And Yahweh is the Vulcan, volcanic God of the Elamites. So, so, so that means... Edomites. So that means you've got a rain god and a sun god within the same divinity. Again, Judaism reflecting Zoroastrianism makes sense. Uh, so that's clearly the case with Judaism. Now, Exodus means that a mi minority part and are aware of what's going on and can benefit from the new paradigm. Leave. Yeah. So that's us. We're the Jews, in other words. I mean, in the sense, the, the, the people who are, well, not necessarily, but the people who are, uh, don't fit any in uh, to, to Egypt, to, don't belong in well, Egypt. Or, or, or For good or bad, but the Puritans of England uh, and Mayflower is the same story all over. It's a mimicking, again, Girardin uh -huh. mimicking of the exodus out of Egypt. That became the exodus out of Europe. And it was especially the exodus out of Catholicism and away from the Catholic Church because Protestantism was hijacked by the states in Northern Europe. And if you just wanted to be, say, a non-state, non-Pope Christian person in Europe, you'd have to become Puritan or a Protestant who was on the line with the state. And of course, it was precisely those Protestants in Northern and Western Europe who left for North America. What they did was that they then mimicked the exodus and then later they would come in vulgar versions of it, like the Mormons going to Utah, etc. So the story of exodus is constantly repeated. The exodus is always a small minority who said, why are we being treated like shit here? Okay, well, we don't want to be part of this society anyway. We're stuck, so this is just a bunch of locusts and losers. Let's leave. So I think when we looking at the interaction between human beings and machines as AI, so for, and this is what Thomas knows way better than I do, I don't see any reason why the vast majority of people will be um, entitled to be part of that process of the human machine interface. I would see that collaboration rather as being an elite group of people who are very adept at, at specializing in what they do compared to what the machine does well. So if the machines are very centered on logos, human beings should be very centered on pathos. And if I would be a machine, I'd probably be interested in a very sexy artist way more than I'd be interested in a logician or a mathematician. But I don't know. I mean, that's an open question. But I'd see an exodus coming around the corner, also an exodus out of woke, meaning the first places in the world that says that we're woke free, we just got rid of the shit, we yeah. stopped guillotining people, we just don't cancel anybody any longer, we canceled cancel culture itself, we deplatformed, did the platforming business. The, you know, anybody does that today would clearly signal that we know what's going on that's wrong, 
And this would be a very welcoming place for people to think freely and express themselves freely. That's not going to happen on a global level at all. It's certainly not happening in America and probably not in Scandinavia. So you need new places where you can go to think and speak freely so you can become smart. That's okay, question. Exodus again. I have a question. Um, usually the Jews are considered like slaves, right? When they're in, in, in Egypt and, and they, 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 you know, they, they're, they're, you're describing the Exodus as, as a bunch of elite people. Yeah. And, and, but, but the Jews weren't a bunch of elite people. They were slaves, right? No, wait a second. They were not slaves in the current Afro-American woke sense. They were slaves in the Marxist sense of proletarians. I wanted to bring Marx in here too. That's yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, this is why there's a connection between Marxism and Judaism. That's why Karl Marx is a Jew. The, the Exodus story dominates Jewish culture immensely, right? The three siblings are at the center. They regard the father, son, spirit, the father, son, mother, whatever Christianity has, is basically mimicking of, of the Jewish triad. So, which is exactly what it is. Well, my that point is, is, like, I think the Jews, Jews symbolize the elite and also the slave at the same time. They have the elite of, of the future. Mm. Uh -huh. So you have a small minority that might look oppressed now, but they see themselves heroically. Yeah. Sure. That is why I always say the Nietzsche's mistake was to make the Ubermensch a singular person rather than a group of people, which Marx did with the proletariat. Now, if you, if you leave a lot of the bullshit Marx did, it calls us Marx and rather than Marxist or whatever you like. Let's not get into that at all. Let's, let, let, let's, let's leave Marx to kill Rousseau for us and they can do the dirty business of the left, whatever they want. So we can save the idea of the proletariat. The Ubermensch should at least be two because then Nietzsche is interested in the savior the Salshant, the Messiah, okay? Uh, then Marx was interested in who are the elite who follow the overman. Mm -hmm. So really the overman is the netocratic savior and the proper proletariat that can only happen now, couldn't have happened before, certainly not in Lenin's Moscow in 1918, uh, can only happen now. So Marxism could eventually be realized as an exodus of an autocratic elite who, whether they leave physical space and go into something more digital, or preferably, they, because they can, they take digital with them to certain physical realms like Estonia or the Czech Republic or, or Singapore or whatever, where they can do as they please. That's what I think is going to happen next. So we're going to see the beginning of the exodus into the digital, that could be the title of the book, but because we owe so much to, to Hegel and Whitehead, we're going to call the book Process and Event anyway. But, you know, otherwise... So there's going to be an exodus from the elites, basically, from the netocrats, basically. Yeah, okay, so a small minority that have a heroic idea of themselves, that's a proletariat. Mm -hmm. They're oppressed, but they're oppressed in the sense that that's okay, we're oppressed now because we're going to rule the world in the future, and this is what we're going to set about to do it. That's the exact opposite of woke victimhood. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with victimhood. It's, a, it's, it's slavery that will be turned into mastery because the slaves are dying to become masters. Now, Nietzsche would love that. Marx would love that. White and Hegel would certainly love that. And I don't see any reason at all why that wouldn't happen. I think that's very, very likely that we're going to get the small elite who say that, okay, let's see the rest of the And then that elite will then be split into three different sections, a symbolic netocracy, mm -hmm. an imaginary netocracy, and a real netocracy as in real resources. And that's exactly what always happened with previous power elites during previous paradigms. So we're looking for the embryos of this elite now, meaning what we're doing with our studies, we're doing paradigmatic embryonism on the population, the global population as a whole. Now, back to the exodology. So what is exodology then? Exodology is the teaching or the knowledge of how to do a proper exodus. What does it mean to have an authentic phallic leader? In what way does he or she lead or, or they lead? Um, and who are the lead following the leader who perform the exodus? That then at best can be mimicked by other peoples in the future to also be successful. And that process is the process of building education. Okay, creating proper leaders yeah. through proper ar archetypal modes. So the, the Salshant, according to the Persians, is split between the chieftain and the priest. Yeah. Okay? Meaning mind and body are separated. This is the only duality that Zoroaster and Ismanism allows. 
meaning the, the later Gnostic misinterpretation of body and mind must be separate so that the mind can be superior to the body, so the mind can be good and body can be evil, would be awfully strange to Sorastor since he didn't even have the concepts of goodness and evil. They did not exist in Persia 3,700 years ago. Asha and Druj mean simply Asha is a constructive mindset and Druj is a destructive mindset. A Druj is, is reversing. It's like a grown-up who wants to be a child. Uh, Asha is a grown-up who wants to become a god. Mm. It's completely Nietzsche. Yeah. Nietzsche was more Zoroastrian than he ever could have dreamed of. So that is where I want to base the exodology. And that's why I don't want to have another ology for the lynch mob. I just want to call it inverted exodology so we realize exactly what it is, that it's a perversion and an inversion of something incredibly healthy and wonderful. And it's probably the worst thing human beings have ever invented, the lynch mob. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it seems like we're living in all these inversions right now. Everything seems very yeah. in inverted. Like, I have a question still, though, and I brought up the last time, and I'm still working on it, and that is the concept of the martyr. Okay, yeah. Maybe and Thomas has some ideas about that. I, 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 yeah, because we have scapegoats, right? And we have heroes and we have victims. And, and we know the scapegoat is a very elastic concept. There are scapegoats that are just completely innocent, being dragged along and thrown in for good measure. We have scapegoats that are clear abjects. So oh, we found a Jew and we're Nazis, so let's kill the Jew, right? Um, and we also know, this is interesting, we also know that we can do whatever we want with the scapegoat after we've killed him. So there's a cynical way using the scapegoat, making him sacred. Mm -hmm. There's a cynical way of doing it. But there are different things we can do with the scapegoat. We're basically, we basically do, free to do whatever we like with a corpse, aren't we? And that- It can is, be turned into a martyr, right? The scapegoat, right? It can be turned I mean, into anything because he can't defend himself. He's dead. Mm -hmm. So- uh, But the usual process of scapegoating is the scapegoat becomes uh, uh, the, mar the martyr or the- isn't that right, Thomas, no, 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 from no, a Girardian no, no, point no, of view? No, no, let's leave the martyr out. Unless you guys have a theory on the martyr coming from Girard, let's leave the martyr out for now, because the mm -hmm. martyr is a very, very, very complex phenomenon. And, and I, you know, it's blowing my brains out at the moment about the martyr. But the, 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 to begin with, the scapegoat can be used because it's a corpse, and that's exactly what the Egyptians do when they build the pyramids. Oh, and that's exactly, mm -hmm. It was only after the Egyptians started building the pyramids, the Persians decided to build the drachmas in the desert and basically just put away the corpses and say that a dead person is a dead person, is no longer there. Soul's gone. Mm -hmm. So it's just dead, 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 dead. Leave it to be eaten by the vultures. So we do not build pyramids because they knew that the pyramids would ruin Egypt, which they did. And they would be, they would be the ultimate tyranny. I think the construction of the pyramids was the ultimate tyranny. Ever. So there's something about preserving a corpse, um, which, which is yeah. bound up with the scapegoat mechanism. We need to go for the Where we're just burning something maybe, would mean you, you, jump, you don't... Maybe you can jump in here. So, so yeah. the idea is that... so. So you have tensions in the community, right? So everybody decides the tensions and the problems in our community, they are the fault of the scapegoat, which is some random person that can easily be killed, like typically a leper or something like that. So the community gets angry at the scapegoat, kills the scapegoat, but during the killing, there's this orgiastic explosion of energy. And after the killing, everybody is suddenly relieved and the conflict is gone because they've kind of projected everything on that scapegoat, right? But then the scapegoat is turned into something holy. So that's why you have this strange connection between um, turn, the community turning against an individual, killing the individual, and afterwards that, that individual that is being killed is then turned into a holy, a sacred object. And that's, that's kind of a, a very core element of, of Girard's theory, right? And that explains a lot of very strange rituals where, where kings are, for example, uh, um, where, 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 where people are first uh, um, um, excluded, killed, and then and then turned into objects of uh, of um, of um, into religious objects, right? Into uh, in, into uh, uh, objects of uh, uh, worshiping. Yeah. This is very interesting because that means this connection between Zoroastrianism and Christianity in two different ways of dealing with the scapegoat mechanism. Girard is, of course, didn't study Zoroastrianism, so what they did was they just they started celebrating the Polgasars in Persia, which is to celebrate your memory for 70 years every day you died. So the, die, the day you died during the 
during the year they would celebrate your memory for 70 years, if you were worthy of it, right? If you were an honorable person, which was a much Jews better do way. That, to, uh, do, Jews do that for a year. You, you, yeah, you exactly. Kaddish so that, they, or whatever for a again, year. Again, right? shared culture. So yeah. they have obviously mm-hmm. influenced. The way to do that was they saw to avoiding building the pyramids and ruining the economy on the pyramids was what they wanted to do because the pyramids were obviously built to impress. So if the dead Pharaoh be buried inside the pyramid, looking at the sun, he'd still be alive and he would rule from there or something like that. So they, they wanted to avoid that. And Christianity, if your right is correct, dealt with it by just making Christ the ultimate scapegoat and put him on a cross. And once he was dead, he died for all our sins. So nobody could long, no longer die for sins. That's why martyrs get interesting in Christianity, for example, because martyrs in Christianity obviously do not die for our sins. They become role models, which Christ was not. No, 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 no. Hmm. You don't no, think so? Gerard, Gerard has written about this. So one of the characteristics of Christianity is that Jesus did it for you. He did it. Yes. You don't need to do it. And that's yeah. why Christianity, the martyrs, they expose the, the victimage mechanism. So they expose the devil, so to say, right? But they're not, ob- they not persons to copy. That's exactly what I said, Thomas. I said they, they're not persons to copy in their behavior there. They're role models in character, meaning they stayed with the faith even when they were under suffering. Yeah, so, mm-hmm. so, so it's like you can be Christian. Look at this guy. He stayed with Christ. He stayed right. with Christ all the way through. He did not die for your sins. Yeah. Christ died for his sins. Well, well the, the, the martyr is conscious of, of, of what he's doing, uh, whereas the scapegoat is just a victim. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay. We're, we're talking Christian martyr here, so let's wait a second. So, the, yeah, the Christian martyr knows he, he, he holds on to the faith and he's the whole time, right? Yeah, because then he's burnt, then he's burnt at the stake, whereas the, the, the scapegoat is just taken from anywhere and used as, as a, like a leper, and right? Because so he's the, there's a difference is, is that he's conscious of what's the process, uh, what's happening. Well, the thing is, this I think it's a scapegoat mechanism that makes you kill a martyr, but in Christianity, the martyr is not the scapegoat. Yeah. In, in Christianity, the scapegoat, the, the martyr, is not a role model by being killed, he's a role model in staying with the faith yes, no yes. matter what. Yeah, agreed. That's yeah. exactly what Christianity won. It, it was incredible. I mean, it had a huge martyrdom culture in the third and the fourth century. It was also way more violent and territorial than people assume. It wasn't pacifist at all. But what Christianity won was that people just saw these guys and were impressed with them, but they weren't scapegoats. And that was also impressive. There must be, there must be another mechanism at here because Christians knew this was preached everywhere. The die, Christ died for us on the cross and he took on, he was later said he took on our sins, but that, that was later. Thomas is right about that. But the point was to, to, to make an end of history, an event to the fact that Christ was on the cross. So no other martyrs on the no. cross could take the place of Christ on the cross. No, but the other martyrs could be lesser gods. They could become saints in Christianity, which Catholicism and Orthodoxy used them for. Mm. As being, look at this guy. He 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 had a terrible life. He failed at things, but he died for his faith. He died yeah. believing in God all the way through. And therefore, if you believe the way he believed, your sins will be forgiven because of Christ on the cross, and we can move forward. Mm-hmm. Now, Zoroastrianism deals with it differently. It wants to get rid of the scapegoat mechanism for other reasons, because obviously, once we move away from a lynch mob of a nomadic tribe and moving to some kind of civilized settlement that we're going to have long periods of peace and trade with one another. We don't want to go to war all the time. We can't have constant lynch mobs in the streets. That's not a unique insight to early Christians or Jews. That it must be a universal insight, something the Indians and Chinese and Iranians certainly dealt with too. Now, the way Sorastor dealt with Mm -hmm. that, to get it out of the way, that's exactly why martyrdom is not even a part of Sorastian culture, where they don't believe in sin to begin with, um, is... He basically said that let's just put the corpses where they belong. Just, just declare them dead. Period. Yeah. So you cannot celebrate a corpse. Yeah. So it's literally I, unclean, unpure, must be thrown out of the community as quickly as possible. And what they did, they built these dorkmas. And of course, when you have desert, you have vultures around. You had vultures to eat the corpses. And that's all they did. That's just a corpse. And they taught their kids. That's no longer grandfather. That's a corpse. Grandfather is gone. And of course, in folk religion, that becomes a separation of soul from the body. But that's not part of Zoroastrian teaching in itself. In Zoroastrian teaching in itself, you die when you die, like Heidegger said. 
And you must live a full life until you die, Heidegger and again, called the Harvatat. And what you leave behind when you die is that everything you achieved in your life can be used by others to build further civilization from it. And that's, of course, the base of the Persian Empire, and that's called Ameritat. So that Ameritat is an ancient Persian for transcendence, meaning what is beyond your death. It's not immortality. It is yeah. you die, but you're, through your mortality, your life becomes meaningful, and precisely because you leave a heritage behind for your sons and daughters to inherit, you made something meaningful out of your life. So you can't make death sacred, right? Uh, no, exactly. The, 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 you can't, what, in Zoroastrianism, you can't make death a, a corpse sacred. That's what you're no, saying. No, no, exactly. And, and so, the, the problem, perhaps, with scapegoating is this ability, or, or paganism, is this ability to make death sacred. In, in some exactly. Kind of so we got the mausoleum of Lenin, the mausoleum of Stalin under communism mm -hmm, in Russia. Mm -hmm, yeah. Pagan phenomena. Again, we got this, you take the fucking corpse, it becomes pathetic, and you go in there oh, after 40 years, and the skin's yellow, and it's all got plastic, and there are flies everywhere. And it's just trying to keep a corpse alive. Yeah. That's interesting. What you, I want to ask Thomas about that because when you read Girard, he, you get the impression that Christianity is the only, the only thing that's ever been invented that has been able to deal with the scapegoat, right? And that doesn't seem to be true. I mean, because other cultures like, you know, Zoroastrianism and, and Buddhism ha had, were not overrun by the scapegoat, right? Uh, it, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure lots of cultures were not, and then there are pagan cultures where, you know, the scapegoat was rampant, but obviously these other cultures than Christianity had a different way or, or uh, of, um, you know, controlling the scapegoat or mechanism. This is, this is a very good question, and um, I still haven't read the book, but Girard has written a book about the Vedic cultures as well. Um, uh, it's about India and uh, so religion in India, and... And so there he, he, sees, he sees similar uh, uh, patterns, also ex expose, exposing the, the victimage mechanism, things such as that. I haven't read the book yet, but mm -hmm. he was aware of this problem and, and he was looking at other cultures. But I agree that it's a pity that he hasn't investigated this more thoroughly. Um, he probably didn't have time. Uh, I mean, the man yeah. had a finite life, right? Mm -hmm. but, but this is a very good... Uh, but I think that, that people are exaggerating this a bit. Um, um, I think that Christianity is, without any doubt, the most spectacular example of the exposure of the victim me mechanism that I know of. Buddhism does something else. Buddhism goes to the to the problem of desire because basically the victim me mechanism comes from the problem of desire, right? And mm -hmm. Buddhism goes directly to desire, but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't explicitly expose this whole mechanism like Christianity does, not in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so Rastanism basically is an heroic religion. It's completely phallic. So it doesn't allow victimhood at all within the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can't celebrate victimhood unless you start celebrating Druj. And if you celebrate Druj, you're a heretic. That's exactly what Zoroastrianism adamantly went after the Gnostics. I mean, they yeah, murdered you're not, Gnostics. You're not going to celebrate victimhood outside of Christian influence, right? Because the, the whole point is that Christianity makes it wrong to kill the scapegoat. So, so that's why, why we have, so basically all these, all these, these uh, mobs that, are so, that have so-called concern for the victim, uh, that's basically a form of perverted Christianity. It's very obvious. Girard has also written about this. Yeah. It's exactly because Christianity is so obsessed with protecting the victim, this has pervaded the entire world. So everybody is now super interested in protecting the victim. And you get a lot of status from protecting the victim. This is a Christian idea. This would, would be completely incomprehensible to Romans, for example. They would not give a fuck. They would not give there a fuck. could be... But what about yeah. the Zoroastrians? Did the Zoroastrians give a... I mean, yeah, that's a is, good is, there something, is there something about Christianity that is, that's, that's so unique that Gerard is talking about? I, you know, I don't have the answer. No, I think... I don't think there were a lot of Buddhists running around, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, like, Buddhists don't, don't sacrifice animals or, you know... Well, hey, Cambodia was a Buddhist country that Pol Pot took over the 1970s sure. and killed two million of his countrymen. So obviously, yeah, but that was Marxism. Buddhist culture. No, it wasn't really. Well, hey, I mean, wait a second. Y y unless nobody studied Marx in Cambodia, not a single. <laughs> I said that to provoke you a little bit. Yeah, no, 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 no. Wait a second. No, I think Gerard is. You're going to say it's Rousseau. I, I, no, I, can I, I wait? <laughs> Gerard is on to something very profound here. The lynch mechanism is universal.
It yeah. belongs to nomadology. So it belongs to the original universal religion. It's been practiced for tens or hundreds of thousands of years. It is, it is in our genes. It, it's something yeah. we need to deal with constantly. I think yeah. Gerard is absolutely right on that. And then we can look at cultural studies to see how it's dealt with. And I think precisely the cultures that are innocent to it and do not have an awareness of the scapegoat mechanism and the lynch bomb are the ones the most vulnerable to it. That's exactly what the Maoist cultural revolution killed tens 20s, 30s of millions of people. And Cambodia was like 2 million out of 8 million died before Pol Pot mm -hmm. was stopped. So I think, okay. I think the cultures that actually are not aware of this, but with the scapegoat mechanism, is something you're born with. Oh, that's people. interesting. So maybe Buddhism yeah. was, was vulnerable because it didn't have that awareness. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, but, but I would say that uh, I, I'd say that both Christianity and Buddhism are unique in their own way, right? I mean, Buddhism has, has, has investigated the problem of desire itself to, to, to a really uh, great extent. Where, 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 because Christianity basically said, like, you know, do not, do not follow these, these patterns because they are dangerous, right? So it's a, it's a very renunciate religion, basically. While Buddhism kind of says, like, well, that's not going to work, right? So Sutra is basically renunciation, right? Renunciation of anger and all these negative things and stuff like that. But then you also have the layer of Tantra, which kind of acknowledges well, you're not going to get rid of that. You have to kind of creatively deal with all these things that, that, that you would like not to be there. Yeah. And that is something that Christianity did not develop to the same extent, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because I but I also have the intuition that, that Tantra has very good ways of dealing with, with the scapegoat on some level, you know, by, by, by enacting it dramatically. And like there's, an, there's a dramatic enactment of, uh, you know, standing on corpses and, and things like that or... or or, or, you know, drinking alcohol and you, you enact the desires, right? There's a dramatic that, enactment which frees you from the, the, this, this, uh, this mob uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the, the mob that would go for the scapegoat by, 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 by acknowledging it and seeing it in yourself and, and by, you know, and... So you really that's, also been, that's also been, this is dialectical religion. So, well, we didn't, we got dialectics from the Greeks onto Hegel in the West, but it wasn't part of Christianity. So, the dialectical means that you know it's going to pop up somewhere. If it doesn't pop up in your sex life, then it pops up in your social life or somewhere else. But it's just mm -hmm. going to come back to haunt you. So, you better include it in your life sooner or later. Certainly, if you're going to be master of your own destiny, you have to include it. Yeah. Nietzsche is. Uh, you know, Nietzsche is adamant about this. So is Freud, and that's because they're sons of Hegel. So. Yeah. That comes to together in dialectics in the West, and obviously that's something the East dealt with all along. They knew that all along. But if, if, if Buddhism deals with desire, uh, it also deals with suffering, right? And the mm. suffering from your own desire. And, and the fact that suffering is so central to Buddhism is, of course, the strongest card because so much of life is suffering. And if you can deal with suffering without turning you into a victim, whereas the people you envy do not suffer, which then just fosters another lynch mob. So you must, in Buddhism, declare that suffering is universal. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's those who suffer and those who do not. And if that happens, then you get exactly the sort of class revengeism or, or a group revengeism mm -hmm. that dominates mm -hmm. our culture today. Yeah. Because if you can declare that I suffer, uh, I've chose to suffer, uh, I, I declare that I suffer and I, I'm the only one allowed to do that. You cannot say, take, speak against me and you don't suffer because I then suffer. No, no. I have every right says, to kill it's a you very, it's a or cancel that, you, take whatever I want away from you. There, there suffer. is suffering is the statement of Buddhism. There is suffering. It doesn't say that, um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't, point a finger of suffering and also there's three other aspects to that that's just the it's first certainly, part. It's that's just the beginning right no people take that as the whole thing right but it's, it's just the, the no but it explains why buddhism and zoroastrianism gels so well again zoroastrianism gels well with others because it exclusively deals with certain things it deals with the heroic it deals with the phallic it is a building civilizations that's exactly what zoroastrianism deals with and it doesn't claim to be the only religion it claims to be the first universal religion in the sense that it's universal religion for an elite. Nobody assumed that you would have a universal religion that all human beings on the planet would adhere to 3,700 years ago. No, you declared a certain teaching along the trade routes that people were allowed to follow. And if they did so, you promised they'd probably be successful, right? Okay, that's where Zoroastrian comes in. That's exactly what Zoroastrian is also the birth of universal human rights because they differentiated between the elite religion that they eventually divided into the priestly religion, the military religion, Mithraism and Zurvanism, and they had a folk religion, which like, oh, you can worship whatever you like. You're all going to worship idols and celebrities and whatever anyway, or at best, Christian saints, 
much better role models than Jimi Hendrix, to be honest about it. So the, the, the idea of the lesser gods was there in Christianity, at least the Catholicism and Orthodoxy. It escaped the Protestants, that's exactly because they were, they were essentially Cartesians and not Christians. But it was there in, in Catholicism and Orthodoxy, and it makes sense. But looking at differently, comparing them, the matrical, the very feminine power of Christianity to Buddhism is something they share. And they did so apparently by Buddhism claiming that we know about suffering and we deal with suffering. So we also deal with the origin of suffering, which is desire itself. That makes sense in a nomadological sense, especially a nomadological religion. What Christianity had to deal with though was that it came out of an eventological landscape, since the Zoroastrians had invented eventology. Yeah. And later, of course, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are also eventological religions, linear time are incredibly important these religions. Mm -hmm. Spectacular yeah. events can change history forever. You could not have invented Christ in the cradle. You could not have invented Christ on the cross unless, and you could not have invented the martyrs later would become saints and lesser gods because of it. You could not have invented that unless you believed events actually changed history forever. Mm -hmm. And that idea is Persian. So the problem is, it seems that when these systems then collide without knowing about each other, which would happen when Western eventology suddenly, boom, got into East Asia in the 1960s and 1970s, these societies are incredibly vulnerable to that. I mean, it's, it wouldn't be too hard if you're a tyrant to say that you're all suffering, and by the way, there are some people who don't, if people are told that suffering is universal, and you say, but there are some people who are not, and they're called capitalists. No, it's not much of a tweak that's needed by Mao to actually say that, right? And that becomes Maoism. Mm -hmm. So I think we're at our most vulnerable when we leave history in our own culture and we don't no longer understand, haven't got a clue of what we're approaching and then we step right into it and then we, cause, then we get the havoc we currently have. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally understand the difference between eventology and nomadology you think is central. I, I think Girard is definitely in the eventological since he bases this on one scapegoat could forever change the landscapes of scapegoat will no longer be needed. That is an eventological change to a nomadological conviction. The nomadological conviction being if you only find somebody to blame things on, we can get release and tensions out of the way and we can move on, have a period of peace until the next build, tension is built up. Now, if you're convinced that's the case, if the shamans are convinced that's the case, the sooner or later we'll have to find the scapegoat and the scapegoating mechanism has to be in place. If you believe in nomadology, that's probably you would see. So I've, I've I'd expect Girard's studies of India would find that still to be the case in India. Whereas with Christianity, because it inherited from Zoroastrianism and Judaism the idea of eventology, it could come up with the idea that if somebody dies on the cross, we could reinterpret that as it's the end of the scapegoat mechanism and see if we can make that work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Then it's interesting to look at the Persian perspective of Christ on the cross. So the Persian perspective is that the two Saucians, I don't know if we've been through this before, but it's part again of the Saucian theory, which is the opposite of the tyrant theory. The Saucian's precursor needed a name. Thomas and I have been talking about it. We eventually settled for the word hyperject. I love the word superject, but unfortunately, hyperject. Whitehead has already claimed that. And he uses it for his subjectivity. So the Whitehead in somebody is called the superject, which is perfect. The hyperject is the precursor to the savior. So the hyperject is somebody who just speaks up against the mob to begin with. So it's the voice, that, the voice of reason and truth opposed to the mob. Mm -hmm. You said there has to be two. When it appears... The hyper, the object is one voice and then the tyrant steps forward. Okay, could be one or two, whatever. Uh, but the, the, we're probably likely to is have... Is this the priest and the, uh, uh, the, priest and the, the warrior again? So, or, or, interesting. Or this is where it gets interesting. Hyperjection. What is hyperjection then? Hyperjection is basically looking into the future and said, where are we actually going? What is possible? Could the impossible even be possible? Where is the promised land? How do we get out of the current mess, out of the current suffering and walk towards our desire, which is the promised land? Okay. How do we do that? Well, you need an Aaron and a Moses. You need a priest. And what does the priest do? He creates the narrative. There is a promised land. The promised land is full of milk and honey. If we just leave everything else behind and we focus on that one spot, the name of that spot is God, and we walk towards God, we will arrive at the promised land. Now, next that is the chieftain who personifies the leadership. He steps forward and says that I personify this. 
and I step up against the lynch mob, which is mm-hmm. Moses' case was that I will take you with me and leave Egypt towards the promised land. And of course, the lynch mob in the Bible is, of course, the Pharaoh regrets that he let the Hebrews leave and he puts himself on a horse and they come storming down and the Red Sea opens and the Hebrews can walk through, speaking of rebirth, and then the Red Sea closes and drowns the lynch mob. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. clearly is yeah. the Jewish lynch mob. The Jewish lynch mob is the Egyptians who go after the Hebrews and try to kill them. Yeah. So there you go with the lynch mob. That's how the Jews deal with the lynch mob mechanism. It's just not us. We should be educated, sophisticated enough in the Jewish population not to go into scapegoat mechanisms, right? And that's how we stay away from it because it's something others do, but we do not because we're a nation and we're superior. That would be the Jewish version of it. Now, the Zoroastrian version of that would be that, well, actually, there are two different ways of being a sociant. If you're so damn successful, you actually go against the lynch mob and they dissolve. Yeah. And then you become a heroic sociant and you win. Yeah. And then you retire. Aristotle built the idea that eventually was personified in Alexander the Great on that very idea. He borrowed it straight from the Persians. He was the Persian Celsion. And Alexander the Great was, of course, by the Greeks at least, declared to be a savior, right? Mm-hmm. So you, we have these great heroes, military heroes, etc. throughout history who claim, claim to be first Celsians. So you call them. But what's interesting with the Persians is they would admit that if the Celsian fails, he speaks the truth, he speaks Asha, but the mob of Druj go after him anyway and kill him. That would be the Persian saying, okay, what do we do then? Well, they put him on a cross and he died. Okay, let's use that since we're free to use the corpse any way we like. Let's use that as a story that says that why don't we make this killing of the savior himself? The hero was killed by us. We killed the hero. Why do we make that the ultimate learning lesson that we need to learn? The ultimate lesson we need to learn that this must never happen again. And that's where you have a connection between Zoroastrianism and Christianity. Zoroastrianists don't have a problem with Christianity. They just say, yeah, they, they, they made their bet on the second Sashant as if it was the final Sashant. We don't. We still think the first Sashant can come. Hmm. I, think, I think these two versions are perfectly compatible with each other. Don't you agree? Uh, I, I don't see the difference. Because basically, uh, okay, so, so Christ dying is basically what well, it exposes this mechanism. Yeah. And then you know, well, let's not go there. But anything else is basically open, right? That's why Girard also emphasizes that the, the Bible ends with the apocalypse, which is this very strange text, very psychedelic, right? It's not yeah. exactly clear what it's about, but it basically means that if you remove this vic- victimage mechanism, you are in trouble because this victimage mechanism works very well. Yeah. It just keep the community calm. Mm-hmm. So All hell know, breaks loose, sort of, uh, uh, before you get to the promised land, right? For 2,000 years, we have seen the collapse of the victimage mechanism. Now it's suddenly back because the internet brings everybody together and makes everything, uh, basically very egalitarian societies where everybody's uh, connected. They're actually very vulnerable to the victimage mechanism. And we killed Christianity. As Nietzsche said, we would. We have done that. Come again? Yeah. We have killed Christianity, so we don't have the Christian yeah, well, it, it seems defense that against the scapegoat. Collapse, the collapse of Christianity, that is something that, that's exactly what you, what you expect, because basically this now the victimage mechanism has really collapsed. So there's no more burning of Jews, there's no more burning of witches, so that kept to a certain extent that sacrificial part of Christianity that kept that together. That's all gone now. So now we are in a very interesting uh, space where, where Christianity cannot use the victimage mechanisms anymore to, to promote this sacrificial form of Christianity. And now, basically, the question is, well, what next? What are we going to do now? Well, so, we're killing, well, we're ki- we're killing sex workers and drug addicts and all kinds of people in our society and a lot of old people, too, because of the coronavirus at the moment. But it's so. more and more difficult, right? No, I don't say it's more difficult. I think we just moved the scapegoat to somewhere else and make somebody else. It doesn't work anymore because there's no unanimity. You can still, I mean, Mm. you can still go after scapegoats, but it's, you do not unite the tribe anymore. Not everybody buys this anymore. Very few people actually buy this. Most people don't speak up, but nobody believes this story that somebody, this guy was completely guilty. There's, that's not very believable anymore. Certainly Mm. not among philosophers and thinkers and stuff like that. I mean, that's just, that train has gone. So yeah. that's not, but it's still operating. It's, yeah, uh, so, it's still unconsciously operating, uh, you know, all over the place. And probably 
Keep, well, I'd, I'd, be care, to, uh, I'd be careful to say Scones is a pagan religion called Nazism, plundered the planet only 50 years ago and certainly killed millions of Jews and gypsies and everything. So it, it, I, I, I'd be no. careful to say it's gone already now and we're tired of it and aware of it to the extent Thomas's claims. I don't think no. so. I don't think, well, I the, think the, 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 you mentioned the apocalypse, and I think the apocalypse has to come first, and then you you get to the promised land or something, right? So well, the whole well, wait a second. Wait, the whole wait a second. Yeah. thing has to fall apart. The, yeah. whole, the whole thing just falls apart completely, and that's well, sort of like there's the return of Christ. Psychedelic, weird. Andrew, there's the return oh. of Christ. You yeah, can't yeah. complete Christianity without. I don't know if Girard has a theory on it. Girard is not the only Christian, after all. I mean, and and after apocalypse, Christ returns. So this time around, Christ is the first Sarsion. Even Christianity claims he has to come back yeah. as the winner so it's it's either another person or somebody else taking the role but it's certainly the proper savior who comes back well the jews would, first say, would say that the christos kind of it moves <laughs> through different different saviors right and christ was sort of one of them and then the christos would move to the next one it's not the man they say it's the wine it's not the wine skin but the the wine right um but yeah, there are, the principle. It's not a personal principle. In no, Judaism. there are it's, there are prophets who probably qualify yeah. for being saints or martyrs or being saviors or yeah. whatever. There are prophets of that quality. There's also a lot of people who just happen to walk by and they said a few things and very little was remembered. And somebody else wrote a book about them afterwards, claiming they said things they never said. Muhammad didn't write a word. He still apparently authored the Quran. I don't know how that happened, right? Probably a Persian wrote it, not an Arab to begin with, right? So. You know, we claim things afterwards and attribute them to the corpses. Okay, human mm. history is full of attribution given to corpses. Let's admit that. We should even go into maybe details to find out what kind of attributions do we give to corpses. Sometimes we cherish them. Sometimes we just, you know, we go pains to kind them evil. Sometimes we blame things on them, so we don't need to take care of that ourselves. All kinds of things. We 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 know that corpses do not speak back. I think that's a great insight that's universal. That's and, why they're useful, or, or you know. That's or, why they the can be used, people, or, or, or at least, or, at least yeah. to the defense of rationalism, they they realize that let's just at least force people to only memorize who they were, and maybe they're the more truthful rather than celebrating the corpses themselves. So you know, it's the, the partition of mind and body does happen at death. Um, Mind is collective anyway. If it's a collective mind, talk about rather than individual mind, then certainly mind survives as the collective anyway. It's through language and memory and everything else. But the body is literally dead. In the case the mind is connected to the body, which is, of course, your own self consciousness, then it's certainly over. The Sorasters never claimed anything else. They never believed anything else. They didn't spend. That's exactly why, even if they were wealthy and successful, they never built pyramids. Their tombs were very small and they locked up their corpses, and that was only of the kings. The Mobits themselves were thrown into the deserts. So the Dorkmas were developed, not originally in Zoroastrian, they were developed later as a response to the Egyptian building of the pyramids. And it was, of course, economically incredibly smart if you're going to run an empire not to spend any more time on corpses. Once people are dead, just get rid of them. May, yeah. I, may I jump in? There's something yeah. I want to come back to about uh, you, you mentioned the Nazis, right? You said, like, well, the victim mechanism isn't dead. Take, for example, the Nazis. Very, very true. A excellent example of basically a, a, an outbreak of, of rampant paganism. But that's exactly what you expect, because if you dismantle the victimage mechanism as coupled to organized religion, right, then it will come out in a disorganized way. That's why we now have these mobs, online mobs of all kinds of all kinds of sorts and shapes. And that's why we had Nazism, because basically the the the, the pagan mechanisms that are in us, in us every, uh, in us all, they are not regulated anymore by religion. So they're just everywhere suddenly. They just break out. That's the apocalypse. Normally, the, yeah. the pagan mob would be would be guided by by pagan religion. So yes, we're gonna kill people, but we're gonna kill the right person at the right mm -hmm. time in a good ritual. Even the Greek did that. You know, the pharmacon. Which you, uh, which you mentioned uh, a couple of episodes ago, right? The, the Greek, they kept slaves that they sometimes would kill, the civilized Greek, right? Yeah. So, and, and the, so, so basically, they, they acknowledged that paganism, but they made sure that it was regulated. But Christianity basically dismantled it, decoupled it from religion. But of course, that mechanism is still in us. So we know it's wrong and we don't want to go there. And, and for 2000 years, we've seen that this is a, a very destructive way of being. But we go there again and again. We can't help ourselves. And that's the apocalypse. That's why we live in apocalypse. A secular society as the apocalypse. That's kind of interesting, huh? Because we would think it's like, oh, 
it's it, it it's being advertised to be the opposite, right? So no. be, be, be some kind of liberation oh, from 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 so religion, wrong. but 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 uh, so wrong, but uh, very wrong. Oh, Nietzsche said that all. Andrew, you you uh, yeah. as, as Nietzsche said that too. Yeah, Nietzsche did, said yeah. that all along. Andrew, you can't yeah. forget about Nietzsche. No, for, sure. Forget about the New York Times. Say we don't even discuss shit like that. We talk about Nietzsche, for example. <laughs> Nietzsche, Nietzsche said you've killed God and you've done it to you will regret it. Yeah, and, and he called blood, blood everywhere. Wait you know, a second, he millions called, of corpses and now what he sees today is the last man syndrome. So we see the last man everywhere in his most pathetic version too. I wouldn't even call it the last man. I call it the last child. If anything, we're seeing today. This is last child culture. And uh, yeah, it's it's gonna get really messy and last messy. child, last man means the you know the, the the kind of the nihilist, the guy who's yeah exactly become become yeah uh, total nihilist meaning um, yeah. yeah. And if you put any sort of energy, even destructive energy or more tido or death drive into the last man or the last child for that matter, you get the current mess. You get exactly woke. You get all this shit that's going on. It's gonna get worse. You get Joker and the yeah. zombie. And, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Tyrants. Well, pop, pop postmodernism right i mean i mean I, i'm i think it's very much uh, worthwhile to study thinkers like deleuze and foucault and stuff like that i'm not going to be be, be uh, very simplistic about it but a lot of the pop interpretations of postmodernism i think that's the last man embodied yeah that's why spinoza without hegel gets so destructive that's where it comes from explain Okay, so if you take Spinoza seriously and you see his weaknesses, you discover that Spinoza insists that the world is one, mm -hmm. but because there is different, he then just suddenly attributes that to, you know, he attributes it to the attributes. He just basically says there are tons of attributes. He doesn't explain how the, the one and the attributes collaborate with one another, how they function in relation to one another, because nothing can be infinite unless it is everything in, in any system, because otherwise it isn't infinite. Right? So, so mm -hmm. you've got lots of problems with Spinoza. Kant, Kant, Immanuel Kant actually is the great critic of Spinoza. He tears him apart. He tears apart that shit. And after that, Spinoza is wonderful as an inspiration to study monism. He is certainly wonderful as an inspiration to study how you can put attributes into the monistic universe. But at the end of the day, the universe does exist of different things. For example, a rock and human consciousness are very different things. They're not just attributes. We talk about, we talk about as emergence vectors in our theory. It's a radically, radical spheres that are separate from one another, although they belong to the same neutrally modest universe. This is all very complex. Spinoza didn't really go into the complexity of it, but Spinoza lacks dialectics. Again, he lacks a dialectical understanding of the world. This, of course, is was Hegel's critique of Spinoza. Hegel loved Spinoza, as we should, but then said, but there's tons of shit lacking in Spinoza. And one of them is that he doesn't understand dialectics. Rather than pantheism, which is what Spinoza preaches, then Hegel preaches pan-dialecticism, meaning that everything, both physical, biological, and mental, whatever, is dialectical, fundamentally dialectical. And it's been proven right again, and again, and again, and again. That's why there's a great Hegelian Renaissance, there's Shishik, there's Adrian Johnston, there's people like me who read Hegel all the time. We love Hegel. And I think- no, That's the concept of the negativity or, or something. No, uh, no uh, negativity, negation, no? big negation, difference, sorry, negation, enormous difference. You must not ever, ever <laughs> use positive and negativity when you talk about dialectic. Negation. Negation, negation. negation is like Buddhist emptiness somehow, and, and that, allows, yes. that allows the whole system to become fluid and alive rather than being some kind of, you know, uh, it reified moves. monism or, or this is exactly okay so hegel is you finish it difficult but brilliant beyond belief so you read hegel through whitehead if you're smart today you read whitehead through hegel and you're probably the two most interesting spheres you could possibly study today to do philosophy now that excludes Spinoza. Why? Because Hegel took Kant's criticism of Spinoza seriously and moved on and put a proper dialectics into the universe. So that means that Hegel, what people constantly forget, is also a monist. There's only one universe. But what he realized is this universe operates dialectically. Everything operates dialectically, which then he solves all the problems Spinoza left behind. Now, the problem is that in the 1960s, people were hippies, right? Now, hippies influenced thinking and art and everything way more than we assume because a lot of people want to be trendy and cold and fashionable. Hippies were like bad monists or, or something. Now, so postmodernists <laughs> are always people who end up with turtlenecks in art galleries, aren't they? Discussing philosophy, right? 
Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's like the Germans in, in the Saturday Night Live show in America, the 1980s, who wore like turtlenecks and had a German accent and they were dancing funny Kraftwerkish dance in Berlin. And they were so you're, you're blaming that ultimately on Spinoza. I mean, no, no, no. I'm blaming, no, I'm blaming the Spinozist well, revival. Spinoza is the first hippie or something. No, wait a second. I'm blaming the Spinozist revival that we saw with Deleuze in the 1970s and with postmodernism. I'm saying that we cannot read Spinoza and ignore Kant, Hegel, and Nietzsche who came after him because what these guys are doing is that they're going back to Spinoza and pretending Immanuel Kant never happened. That, that's, like, that's, like, that's like believing the earth is flat, right? The, the revolutionary Kant changed his philosophy forever, at least in the West. We saw re- traces of it before in the East, but never before in the West. And you cannot, read, you cannot not read the Greeks, you cannot read Christianity, you cannot read anything unless you see this tremendous revolution. Now, what Hegel did was that he then, he then turned Kant against himself by saying that, well, Kant's separation of the noumenal and the phenomenal is kind of ridiculous too. We might as well move everything into the phenomenological, phenomenological to begin with. That's Ding and Sich was removed by Hegel, which is fantastic. So Hegel introduces process philosophy to the West through dialectics. The pan-dialecticism of Hegel is the pan-organicism of Whitehead and avoid pan-psychism at all costs because pan-psychism is essentially what Spinoza is. So pan-psychism, where does that appear? In France in the 1960s and in California in the 1960s. In California in the 1960s, culturally, in in France in the 1960s, more philosophically speaking. And these two then blended. And one worship was exported across the Atlantic to America and became Pomo. And the other one was exported back to Europe, became essentially, you know, the guys, the art galleries, the turtlenecks, you know, the pretentious philosophers that I always disliked in Europe. So that's Pomo. And Pomo is, to a large extent, vulgar Spinozism. and vulgar in the sense that it's too close to Spinoza's original teachings without taking Kant and Hegel seriously. I've, I've never heard I've never heard about this link between Spinoza and uh, and postmodernism. I, I know that Kant and postmodernism have been linked, but uh... no, no, not at all. No, Kant. No, they fight with Kant all the time. Today it's called speculative realism. It's been the dominant mode for the past twenty years, and. Graham Harman and all these guys are into speculative realism, and they also believe they can get beyond Kant by going back to the pre-Kantian. I, I don't think they can at all. You can't go back to the pre-Kantian. It's just impossible. We know that the noumen of the phenomena are always separated, but so what? What if the noumen well, is well, well, important? Well, you, know, you, you do know that Whitehead, both Whitehead and Heidegger, basically the, their, uh, their program is to, to get the phenomenon and the nominon to get that idea out of the philosophy, right? So yeah, it's but but very come on, Heidegger. It's very much uh, not agreeing with this Kantian. Heidegger, Heidegger becomes a German country poet when he tries to do that. You can't do that. You've got to go through the Hegelian in that case. Okay, so Heidegger does it better when he just imitates Hegel. But what, what you do is that you move into phenomenology, period, and that's what Hegel did, and then he realized everything is dialectical. You can go back and then study science and mathematics and logos so much as you like and discover it's dialectical too. Everything changes all the time. That's fundamental, right? So without going too much into those details, I think, I think we need to, if you're going to criticize Deleuze at its weakest points, and Deleuze is the one I will say, Lacan is not part of Pomo. Lacan is a Hegelian through and through. Let's get Lacan out of the picture. That's exactly why people like me and Shishik and Johnston are reading Lacan, we're reading Hegel, and we're reading Girard, and we're reading Nietzsche. But if Pomo is just a vulgarization of pop philosophy of some kind appearing in the 1970s in France and America, will we have problems with Foucault and Deleuze? Certainly with the later Deleuze. Certainly with the Deleuze, Deleuze and Guadari. They, hey, they, I, I think that bring it back, like maybe to, a, to it's, the, a, it's a parody of Nietzsche. I mean, even the way they write, right? I mean, I'm reading Derrida now, which is great. I mean, it's like reading a sacred text. It's like reading the Bible. They got that from Nietzsche, also as Zarathustra. He was the guy who started this, this tradition. And yeah. uh, so a lot of postmodernism. I mean, I, I like reading these, these texts in the sense that, you know, I'm very at home. I'm, I'm used to reading Long Champa and stuff like that. These guys are writing uh, secular sacred texts. Especially and like, and oh, vulgar like, Nietzsche. Like, vulgar Nietzsche is a vulgar Yes, vulgar Nietzscheanism. And they never read Hegel properly. They read Hegel through Hippolyte or Kojev, only indirectly. Kojev, yeah, right. Yeah. That means that the Lerse's critique of Hegel is his weakest point. And the problem is that he disguises it with Spinoza worship. 
So, that means he, he goes for Spinoza without Hegel. Hegel wrote a lot about Spinoza. Hegel had a fellow called Schelling, and Schelling was a Spinozist who was then converted into Hegelian during his own lifetime. If you read the older Schelling, you go back to the younger Schelling, you see enormous differences between the two. So Schelling was the Spinozist after Kant, who tried to go back to Spinoza and escape Kant with his Natur Philosophia. Hegel knew that was impossible. Left and said, "No, Kant made a revolution. Let's go even dig even deeper, and let's turn Kant against Kant. What would Kant have said about Kant critically?" And that's where Hegel moved wonderfully in the early 1800s with his amazing philosophy. He's still the greatest. You're just gonna, I just have a question. I want. I want to try to if we can bring this back to the lynch mob idea a little bit. Okay. Um, are, are you are you are you connecting a false reading of Spinoza? Uh, like to to let's say to the '60s America and to the postmodernists and to the present lynch mob situation. Can you can you like? Is that what you're doing? Don't yeah, because and, and can you can you like? Flush okay, that out call a bit? it vulgar spinocism. And vulgar spinocism is just pop philosophy that hasn't studied this shit. That's California New Age to you. Oh, everything is united with everything okay, else. Okay, gotcha. The world is one. The new we're age, all sitting here together. Okay. And if you only listen to each other and listen in to each other, we say we'll all be peaceful and there'll be no antagonisms between us and no class differences. And all we need to do is to sit we're all and talk and, and talk like that. And, then you move that into yeah. woke culture as practiced by woke people. It's the same shit. That's how woke meetings are. They sit and talk. But they add some anger to it by having yeah, an outside anger, scapegoat like, yeah. they can mm -hmm. blame. So you take California New Age or vulgar spinocism, which is POMO, and then you put that into context when you just add some electricity to it by basically telling a 22-year-old girl that, oh, by the way, there's a 47-year-old white, white man outside is a white heterosexual. He's a working class guy and refuses to commit the revolution. Oh, I can go after him. He's my scapegoat. And off they go with their pagan scapegoat mechanisms. That's okay. exactly what we're seeing today. Yeah. Okay. So in that sense, if Poe was guilty of creating woke, it's a precursor to woke, yes. Is Pomo vulgar? Yes, it is, because it's essentially vulgar Spinozism. That's what it is. And that's what you get if you read Spinoza too literally and believe he speaks directly to you and you're a little Spinoza genius and you're not actually reading the amazing critiques, constructive critiques of the honored Spinoza that were written by Kant and Hegel and the other guys in the 1800s. You can't, you can't. You can't just, is a so what's the hey, thing that, hey, what's the thing that, uh, sorry about this, what's the thing that, um, uh, Kant uh, 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 changes. What is? Can you explain that? What's the step from Spinoza to, to Kant? Transcendental we dialectics. About. Transcendental dialectics. Yeah. Okay. So he does dialectics, and he's he's seriously considering the difference between my here and and that thing there. That in itself divides the world between the noumenal and the phenomenal. So the unity, the sort of romantic unity of Spinoza's universe, disappears. Also. Spinoza says God has a will. We have no wills. The problem is there's no will to power in Spinoza. You will, don't will anything, Andrew. I don't will anything. Thomas doesn't will anything. And this idea of a sort of passive subjectivity that just floats around here and there. Damasio used to be Spinoza's, but he turned against Spinoza, interestingly enough, in the 2010s. That's interesting mm -hmm. to see how he started saying it. No, 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 no. The vulgar Spinozism wasn't what I meant with Spinoza being back in fashion and rereading Spinoza as a good idea if you're a cognitive scientist. D Damasio is too smart for that. He turned against well, that and there's became... No, there's no contingency in the universe of Spinoza. So yeah. basically there is, mm -hmm. there, is, there is God that knows everything, the past and the future. That means that there is no real, there's no real contingency. If no, you would run the yeah. universe, if you would stop the universe here and you would run it again, so to speak, then you would get the same outcome. There's no, it could not be otherwise. So that's, that's the, the block universe of Spinoza. And it's the universe of Einstein as well. Einstein was... It is. Oh, yeah, it is. Hmm. It is, but, but can you see also in the vulgarized version how attractive that is to hippies? You don't want to commit themselves to anything because it takes an effort to make a commitment? Oh yeah, accept what is and stuff like that. Yeah, yes. yes. Yeah, and and it all. And there's a lack of. I'm getting a lack of masculinity too. I'm getting. Oh, a kind totally. Of, yeah. I'm getting a lack of energy uh, in in the. A lack of will. The sack that that Spinoza could could become. Uh, in, okay, so Nietzsche's response to that is, of course, will to power. Yeah. Okay, the way to do that, take it seriously, now is to divide will to power again, split phallus into will to intelligence and will to transcendence, mm -hmm. and because machines will not have will to transcendence, the lonely will to intelligence. We can make the machines operate beautifully for the priests. 
but at the same time we need chieftains to actually go out and lead and create society as a work of art and that would cry, require will to transcend it. This is way, way from Spinoza. And this is where Deleuze struggles with nomadology and everything he did in his last 10 years, in that actually, if there was a Deleuzean heritage, yeah, he could be interesting for complexity science and pretentious art or whatever, but, but if you're gonna, if you're gonna, you're gonna make something forceful out of Deleuze and his desire originally when he was younger was to be Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. And I, I love Deleuze's 1960s work. I will definitely save difference of repetition and, and uh, uh, the sense book, a theory says, I, I would save those books from the logical sense. I would save those books from what comes later. Um, Deleuze and Nietzsche, the early Deleuze, I, I love and adore. And I think he opens up Nietzsche to, to an eventological interpretation of Nietzsche, which I use a lot in my work. But I don't find these sort of grandiose books like Thousand Plateaus at all as useful now as they were thought to be in the 1980s. I think actually going down the John Dewey and Deleuze Guattari uh, path towards education for youth would be disastrous today. You'd just be hippie all over. Anthropo- anthroposophical, anthroposophical, you, you know, it's just anthroposophical. It's theosophical. It, it's just, it's just tippy dumb. Can just, you elaborate a bit on that? What, what are, what are Dewey? You mentioned Dewey and Deleuze, and they have ideas on education. Is that correct? Is that yeah, right? and 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 it's to today when the world's falling apart and becoming chaotic. Order in schools is more important than ever. Again, dialectical. If if the world is chaotic. Even more important to teach order. order. And if the world is, yeah. you know, if the world is ordered, you can you can elaborate on like letting your kids be be more loose and experimental. So I, I would say that's a perfect example of where it's not very useful to go towards the lesson got to read today. And of course, even if Thousand Plateaus is a great book, an interesting great book, it's the crap that comes afterward. I hate Hart and Negri and their Empire book and shit like that. It's the crap that comes afterward. They who call themselves neo spinosis by the way. I'm not a big fan of Alain Badiou either, and certainly not of Hart and Negri. And that stuff that comes afterwards, Althusser. If you have a problem today with neo-Marxists, it's probably Althusserians you're talking about. You're talking about Spinozists who claim to be Marxists. Hmm. That's Louis Althusser. Louis Althusser is the grandfather of woke. Then comes Laclau and Mouffe along in the 1980s with the hedge money book. That is the Bible of the woke culture today. Hmm. Judith Butler, they're all responsible for that. And, and it all goes back to a vulgar Spinozism that avoids Kant and especially avoids Hegel. Hegel is the nasty word that should be used today aggressively. And thankfully, guys, your favorite Whitehead and Hegel are very closely aligned with one another. Read them through each other and you get them both. I mean, to me, Hegel and Whitehead are, oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I have to stick with Whitehead. I can't, I can't add Hegel to the mixture. There's no time. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you've become the white I've been expert, reading Hegel, but I, 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 do, I have a rough time of it, I have to admit, uh, trying, reading Hegel. I, I am reading it, but very slowly. And I think Adrian Johnston's doing a great job at this, and some of these ideas are always his as, mine, as much as they're mine, although I've seen it coming for years, too. We've been in dialogue for years. I think Adrian is incredibly underrated because he's the only American continental philosopher, but his continental philosophy is brilliant, and he's a Hegelian. But he's also defending something I don't defend, which is transcendental materialism, and I find that interesting. There's, there's much more Marxism in Adrian Johnson's work than I would ever have been to. Well, I was that's thinking dialogue is interesting here, very interesting. What about Heidegger here? I was thinking about like uh, I was thinking that what I lean towards Heidegger and Thomas leans towards um, White, Whitehead, and I, I was wondering like people who have a kind of mystical like I lean towards mysticism, I, I, <laughs> and and people who have a, have a kind of like more scientific thing lean more towards White, Whitehead. Am I right there or not? Um, I can use, I, I'm a social philosopher. I can use Heidegger now and then, but you know, the good old Nazi is not very useful for social philosophy. He's very introverted. It's, uh-huh. well, it's very much on how you experience the world. And you always end up thinking that, yeah, you could experience the world Heidegger describes it. And he does that really well, but that's probably just Heidegger. And a few Heideggerians actually do experience the world that way. 
So, Whereas uh, Whitehead is much more neutral. He's just I have a question like, about Heidegger. Is Heidegger. So, yeah. so, is, so Heidegger is basically from phenomenology, right? He describes what it is like to be human in a very unusual way, so you can kind of get a new perspective on it. But to what extent does, does he actually have a metaphysics? So, because Whitehead is a very is a well, he's against metaphysics. I mean, is he, isn't is he? Isn't he trying to try to destroy <laughs> metaphysics on, on some <laughs> level? <And> they <laughs> pointed out that uh, you know, no, uh, Heidegger has a metaphysics, and, and I was got, got a bit unsure about he, that. Heidegger Heidegger said he didn't have a metaphysics and he hated it, but he used the word metaphysics in a very original sense. Right. It was a certain history that he was opposed to. He was very grandiose when he was young and he wanted to kill it. I'm not, I'm opposite to the less. I'm actually think sign and sight is a bit overrated. I read it when I was young and I was inspired by it. But since I didn't want to become a pretentious poet, it wasn't really for me. So, but I love the old Heidegger. And I know Thomas got to start the Nietzsche books that he wrote in the 1960s. I think the older Heidegger is way more interesting. And he sometimes nails things beautifully. I mean, he's, he's uh -huh. an Oscar Wilde at, you know, an Oscar Wilde without the sense of read It's fun to read, I think. It is fun to read. In well, that's the only reason, you know, I, but I, I, I read them. But you cannot I mean. create the Heideggerian system to describe the internet age or the network society. Mm -hmm. It's useless. I can use Heidegger to discover that das Mann is the origin of the anaject, because that's yeah. actually lacking in Girard's theory because he didn't look into the precursors. Fine, Girard didn't have to. Now, the theory becomes more complete, and I can also make both an exodology and inverted exodology by discovering that the anaject must then have a precursor to the savior. So where's the origin of the savior? Is it Christ in the cradle. No, but Christ in the cradle was probably symbolically very important to declare that the precursor would come there. It could be on the Baptist and somebody else the precursor too. But the precursor is the guy who steps up against the lynch mob. So John the Baptist's head on the plate hmm. is clearly a precursor to the Messiah in Christian mythology. Yeah. So that's why the hyperject is where I'm going next in my studies to conclude the exodology. Hmm. And then the priest, if you're the first Sashant like Moses, you don't go into the promised land. Almost symbolically, you switch from first to second Sashant by dying before you enter the promised land. But you do send the chieftain into the promised land because he's the physical guy actually leads them into the promised land. Because for you, the journey was the only thing that was important. And that's yeah. typical yeah. for Sashants. For the Sashant, his only interest is to complete his work. And his work is to stop the lynch mob and many people realize that this is a fantastic golden opportunity in history to do exactly the opposite thing of lynch mobbing, mm -hmm. which is to leave the lynch mob, get out of it, and walk in the opposite direction into the promised land and be heroic. Right. And so that's you, why I'm interested in phallic, because the phallic is ultimately what is lacking today, not even religion, but phallic religion itself is lacking, and that's where I want to work. That's where we're completing our trilogy with the exodology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. First synthesis, have, uh, yeah. We have the false Dionysian, right? Oh, we have that still, yeah. The false Dionysian and authentic Dionysian. Or, basically, yeah. it's the kick that you get from joining the mob, right? So that's this Dionysian feeling. That's this, you know, the, the, the frenzy of the kill. Uh, now you yeah. get that via Facebook, right? I mean, look, I wrote this, I wrote this first, I got him. So that's this Dionysian feeling, but it's of course the fake Dionysian, right? This is kind of like a very, a very bleak and, and, uh, and unrewarding form of the Dionysian. I, so I, describe I, the real Dionysian then, the, the, the good Dionysian. That's this ecstatic sort of communitas where you get together. Burning Man. Burning Man, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 it's Burning Man. It is, oh. it oh, is, God. it is paradigmatically heroic uh, as a collective effort. So it is, um, Dionysian is crowd, but this is crowd rather than mob, and it's crowd in the sense that it takes on the heroic. Why Burning Man works is because you have to make an effort for yourself to go there, you have to make an effort to survive. It's called radical self-expression, radical self-reliance. If the principle of radical self-reliance wasn't there, Burning Man would be another lynch mob probably and then fail. But it stays and goes on year after year after year, and has 200 copycats around the world, again, mimicking works here as well. And these are authentically Dionysian. Dionysian. So these are the festivals and the carnivals of religion where you celebrate. Carnival. Yeah, carnival. 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 Yeah. carnival. carnival is authentic Dionysian, exactly. Yeah, gotcha, carnival. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the Exodus would be Apollonian, wouldn't it? 
it, it requires organization, commitment, yeah, yeah, belief, yeah, faith, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, theory. It requires priest. It requires chieftain. It requires a hell of an effort. That's exactly why it's small elite to actually perform the exodus. You don't live in the Dionysian. This, this is an event. The Dionysian should always be like limited in time. Otherwise, it kills you. Basically, I think that... Yeah. Yeah. Festival it, days, it, like, you know... Burned yeah. up because he lived constantly in the Dionysian. In the end, he actually realized that he did it because he started... We started uh, writing uh, the crucified, right? He identified actually in the end with Jesus. Which yeah, he said, I am the crucified, didn't he? Has killed me. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a very interesting turn he took at the end of his life. Girard also writes about that. It's very fascinating. These two guys, you know, Girard and Nietzsche, we should have had them in the same room and, and uh, let them have a discussion. Oh, God. And Whitehead. I, I don't know. Whitehead would just drink tea. The ultimate nerd. The ultimate yeah. nerd. He's too much of a nerd. I was thinking that, too. A Whitehead was... I think Gerard's a bit of a nerd, too. Uh, Nietzsche doesn't belong on any other planet except his own. He, I, would, I would have loved Hegel because he was actually incredibly successful and flamboyant and fun during his own lifetime. He became a multimillionaire in Germany. Why don't we train AI from Hegel manuscripts, yes. manuscripts, and then we start, we let them talk to each other? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they resurrected from the dead. Yeah, we have to resurrect <laughs> have all, of these, of all of these souls and, and put them on the AI machine. God. We let them talk to each other, just like, you know, Microsoft did that with some kind of bot that was trained from, uh, from a lot of example texts and stuff like that, right? So... That might, that might actually work. Yeah. Uh, and we could resurrect Carl Schmidt, see whether he'd be Nazi or not. <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we throw White Heidegger in there and stuff like that. You probably just, have to do like a Futurama, we have to lock their heads up in a cabin or somewhere, they won't get bodies. So they just, they just upload it. And we resurrect 200 philosophers and we just let them uh, discuss for a million years, which we can probably execute in one hour. I um, have to discuss this with Simon Critchley and finally get him back yeah. to work on a follow up to his amazing book, Dead Philosophers. <laughs> mm. Resurrected Philosophers is next. That'd be a great idea. There's the Monty <laughs> Python skit with all the philosophers playing football. Have you seen that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah classic, yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 well, you can study Hegel or White the rest of your life, and they're, they're richly rewarding when you do it, and I love both guys to bits. But I, I would insist that this is philosophy, and, and um, the relationalism of Whitehead looks more and more like the pan dialecticism of Hegel to me, the more I read them. Oh, yeah, but, but it's true. Bradley, right? So Whitehead was, he, did, in, in, he claimed he never read Hegel, but he read Bradley. And Bradley yeah. was, the, was the British interpreter of Hegel. Um, and so that's, that's the connection between, between Whitehead and Hegel. And so again, I, that is a very uncorrupted version because the problem with Hegelianism in Europe was that it was either through Kojef or Hippolyte in France. The French took over Hegel in the 1940s. Obviously, Germany was in ruins. So we only got these different Hippolyte and Kojef readings. It wasn't until Lacan that we finally got a proper Hegelian reading that he opened up to. And that's exactly why Hegelians like uh, me and, and Johnston and, and Slavoj Žižek and Nalenko Zapanchis are all coming out of the Lacanian school and we're Hegelians. That, that makes perfect sense. This is, this is a Hegelian reading that's way closer to Nietzsche and Whitehead as it should have been all along. But, uh, you know, Hegel had actually had a, a theory of desire that was very close to Girard's, but his was, uh, his was a diet instead of a triad. So mm -hmm. you want to be desired by somebody else, while, while the desire of Girard is a, is a triad, right? Mm. There's always a third, third yeah. wheel in there. Yeah. Yeah, so, but, so, but would yeah. Hegel need a third wheel since he was dialectical anyway in anything? I think so. Yeah. I think that this, this is a, uh, he saw, he had a very important insight, Hegel, but Girard kind of, um, he, 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 uh, he perfected it, yeah. Great. I'll look into that. Oh, one more thing before we finish tonight. The martyrdom thing. So is martyrdom universal or is it exclusively for only some religions where it pays off? And who is the martyr really? Because the martyr can be both really nasty and incredibly, uh, incredibly wonderful and respected human being. I right? think the Romans didn't have this. I think this is a Christian thing and an Abrahamic thing. Abrahamic thing. I think so. I mean, it feels like an Abrahamic thing to me, yeah. It's like you have to go through a torture chamber and stay with your God, even if you're being tortured, otherwise you're not a martyr. Then the Zoroastrians don't have martyrdom either. They don't have a word for it. There's not much martyrdom in Buddhist texts. You know, there's, there's 
It's just it's it's kind of an unclean. There's something about it that is is. If somebody if somebody puts a knife against my throat and threatens to kill me if I don't declare myself to be non Zoroastrian, I can say that I'm a non Zoroastrian. And also, yeah. Rastans, no Bedins would accuse me of anything because yeah. I'm being threatened with well, my life. Well, the problem Why is, I guess, I the, worship, the worship of death, right? That, that's what. No, 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 no. Worship no, of, it, of like, no, the corpse, no. It's, a, it's a worship of a certain principle that is incredibly strong and attractive, though. I have to admit that. You, you have obviously, martyrdom worked for Christianity, it may be popular. And, and he created a whole pantheon of saints, which is incredibly useful. You got all the lesser gods of Catholicism for the next 2,000 years from martyrdom because martyrs, obviously the vast majority of saints are martyrs one, one way or the other. So it was very useful for Christianity. Whereas Orestinists have dragged along the folk religion for as long as it lasted, you know, with the Anahita worship and things like that, um, which made Orestinism better for inclusion, meaning you're going to have a pluralistic society, power sharing, and you're going to have different levels, like you can have an elite religion here and you can have a folk religion here, which is just like India operates. It's just Brahmanism and Hinduism, and that became like Zurvanism and folk Zoroastrianism. But, but the problem with that is that you do not actively replace the pantheon of the lesser gods, which Christianity did, and instead put the martyrs in there and find them very useful. Church paintings and everything. Well, also, I think that the, the martyrs, religion, like if you read the lives of the saints, the martyrs are always, they're always, they have, they're always morally pure. They always have this, there's, you know, there's everything about them is perfect. There's, there's this kind no, of no, idealization. No, 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 Compared no, no. to like, like the, when no. I read about, and, like, Andrew, um, there are no such people Tibetan in Christianity. Saints that they're always, they used to be like, uh, you know, murderers and killers and no not, christianity is the same well, read, starting read the with paul read the lies wait of the a saints. second it's wait like, um, starting with saint paul mm -hmm. paul persecuted the jews and killed them and went after them and then on the road to damascus he became saint paul no christianity is full oh, that's of true people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's there full of people who oh transcended themselves by staying true with their faith even through death and torture the martyrdom yeah. is precisely the human who goes beyond being human, but stays human in the process. Christians would be adamant that martyrs are, nobody's perfect. Everybody's a sinner in Christianity. Everybody's a sinner in Christianity. Yeah. Everybody's a sinner. They're no perfect. No, they're not role models to look up to because of their lives. They're role models to look up to because the principle stands on the faith itself. Okay. But it yeah. does seem to be a, um, a copying of Jesus Christ, right? So let's do it again. And it's kind of ignoring the fact, you know, the gospel is the good news. It's kind of like, you know, Jesus did it for you. He did yeah, it once yeah. and for all, showed the victimage mechanism. It's done. It's written down. He's done it for you. So it's a new kind of mimesis. It's a new kind of imitation that's taking yeah, over, like, it, like a it, kind it, of a... certain. I mean, it is a certain, uh, it is a certain uh, wanting to be the savior yourself as well, right? There could certainly be those cases, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Them, some of the martyrs were obviously narcissistic assholes. And some of the martyrs were probably fantastic people to look up to. And yeah. it's probably the same with the saints in that case. And, the, and uh, Islam also. Uh, Again, we can big... use the corpses for whatever we'd like. And Christianity has done so very creatively over the past 2,000 years. Probably Mother T T Teresa wasn't a very nice person at all. But, you know, at the end of the day, her corpse could be used for good purposes for the church. And they gladly did. So, so there's a certain cynicism in, in, the, in the usage of corpses after they're dead because we have the liberty to do whatever we like with them. They're dead after all, right? We do what we want with the heritages. So yeah. we do. So, which, which is fine. I, I, think pro, I think Thomas's critique of martyrs being narcissistic copycats of Christ on the cross in those cases where it's true is a classic Protestant critique of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. It makes sense. It, it just made Catholicism so much richer religion. In Islam, they seem to love, they love martyrs in Islam as well too, don't they? Isn't that something that you, you would, you would want to be a martyr? Like you would, you would just train to be a martyr. And that would be your, you, you would have that as a goal, right? Yeah, but they don't have the sainthood that you have in, Christ, in Catholicism. That you're more or less mm -hmm. guaranteed if you're a martyr and somebody saw you die, right? Mm. You go to paradise. You're living yeah, for the afterlife. I'd be careful to have. That's exactly a martyrdom. I might even leave it out of the book. It's a very, very, very interesting topic, and it probably fascinates because Orastism doesn't think much of it. It certainly is a huge part of Islam, and since Islam has mimicked Orastism to a large extent, they got it from Gnosticism or something like that. It's, it's something Gnostic about martyrdom, and yeah. 
But I, I'm not an expert in Islamic martyrdoms at all, martyrs at all. Um, and certainly haven't figured out right the relationship between the Gnostic and the martyr. It's probably a nasty one. Um, so, but you I can, to, I can you say, yeah. have to explain martyrdom um, with respect to um, uh, triangular desire. So you have to kind of take a look at, for example, things like sadomasochism, um, because, because it, it, you, you will probably find the, the explanation there. So Girard has some very interesting theories and, and that basically explains why do people, for example, adopt sadomasochistic relationships uh, and, uh, or, or, for example, the relationships of a, of a, uh, you know, a, a cult follower and a guru. So these are, these are basically elementary, um, elementary outcomes of, of triangular desire. Hmm. Yeah, that's getting closer. I, th I think that it's, yeah. I think it's and there's a nasty side to that whole thing with sort of masochistic narcissism leading up to martyrdom, certainly. But uh, I'm sure the people who were just scapegoated and happened to be nice people and, and who refused to, you know, at the end of the day, if you're being tortured and you go through suffering, you're probably going to die. And they tell you to resign from your faith. And the guys standing in front of you are just ugly idiots. It's just like, why would you give it to them? They're going to kill you anyway. You might as well stay with the faith. That's probably how most martyrdoms actually occurred. You know, so, um, but it's an yeah, interesting... The, the stories are always told in a heroic way, right? Yeah, exactly. Heroic. Martyrology is a, is a topic open to our students to explore if they like to. I think, I, I think, I, I think I'm fine with starting the Sochant and the Resurrection of the Fallows for the new book. And then off I go. I just, I'm turning 60 next year. I'm ready for a commentary with cigars and cognac. And so John Sedekis says the same thing. We'll see what happens next. But we're going to write a fucking Bible at least first process and event we're working on it and i'm thrilled of having these discussions with you guys and credit you for your inputs so gerard and whitehead that's a great combination that should be uh, and hegel and nietzsche and hegel okay hegel oh yeah whitehead is already in there so who needs hegel but you know yeah. nietzsche, whitehead gerard that's kind of like the triad i would like to see in a book no. uh, yeah we got our own pantheon there don't forget lug chempa <laughs> but anyway <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll read Derrida, right? I mean, we need some lesser gods too, guys. Okay, 